everyone. Um, okay, so I'm a first-time conference speaker, and I've already got a pro tip for you. Um, wear something comfortable, and consider microphone placement and stairs, and not looking like a wizard. Um, <laughs> so. Um, anyway, before I carry on, I need to um, give a content warning. So if you're photosensitive, you may not be comfortable looking at the slides behind me, because from this point on, they'll consistently display a lot of flashing content. Um, I work at the Financial Times, which is a global news organization, and I'm proud to say that the FT is recognized for its integrity and accuracy. And if you listen to um, Rhys Evans, um, yesterday talk about speeding up without slowing down, then you're to a certain extent familiar with our web performance culture and our practices. So I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I'm a senior developer and I lead a team um, that's implementing the EU's general data protection regulation on FT.com. So yeah, can I get a show of hands for those of you familiar with the GDPR? Okay, the sound of a thousand violins. I'm not going to talk about GDPR either. What I'm going to talk about is rooted in something personal. And it's my first experience of attending a web performance meetup. That was London Web Perf in winter 2016. I got there and I was like, ooh, where are the women? So I was really wimpy and I sat at the back and <laughs> That wasn't a one-off experience for me, but London Web Perf is still one of my favorite meetups, and all credit to them and the web performance community for organizing what I feel is an inclusive and respectful and, frankly, really great conference. 2017 was a strange time to be alive. Um, certainly, if you follow the news, the picture that I painted was rather bleak. There's like, ooh, the daily misadventures of American presidency and Britain's divorcing the EU and Europe's shameful response to a growing refugee crisis and also my own country, Romania, facing some of the vastest civil unrest since the fall of communism in 1989. And the radio wasn't too good either. So um, at the time, I didn't know if I wanted to continue living in the UK, so it felt like the perfect time to quit my job and follow my dream of writing code for a living, um, because I'd been writing code as a hobby for quite a while. And um, as always, I have impeccable timing, because about a month later, an internal memo written by a now former Google employee, James Damore, was leaked. And if you're not familiar with it, then look for it and read it, and I can recommend a really good women's log sewing competition that you can watch on YouTube for afterwards, so hit me up. <laughs> <clears throat> In a nutshell, James Damo argued that women are biologically and psychologically different to men, because, duh. And that apparently explains why there are less female software engineers and also why women are less likely to succeed in this profession. So, like, all my watts. But it got... The internet and everyone talking about diversity from all perspectives um, more than ever before. And that was a good thing because it matters to us as a society and it means we care about it. So in the tech community and even beyond the tech community, we spend a lot of time arguing about diversity. But in the words of Big Sean, who's a rapper, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. So um, I want to take a real close look at the dialectic in a diversity debate and see what's helpful and what isn't. Okay, I'll start with the Financial Times. I love working at the FT. I've never been so happy in a job. Globally, there's an almost even gender split um, among the FT's workforce. Actually, there are slightly more women. At board level, representation of women is 36%, which is higher than the UK's voluntary um, targets by the government of um, 33% by 2020. And by 2022, the FT will have reached gender parity in a senior leadership team. That's our commitment. And that's what's known as a diversity quota. People have strong feelings about diversity quotas. So do I. They're like a starter scapegoat for all anti-diversity rhetoric. And people argue that quotas are anti-meritocratic because it seems weird and contradictory that you would have numeric requirements on hiring and promoting folks based on attributes like gender and race. 
And I've read and heard many variants of, I was hired because I am a token person, and also accusations along those lines, which is very worrying. But I think the biggest flaw with diversity quotas is that they can trick us into thinking that our work is done once we have hit a target, like, boom, we fixed inequality. If only it was as simple as that. So um, is anyone here familiar with the um, American TV series Mad Men? No? Okay, great. Um, it's one of my favorite TV shows. I can recommend it. It's about an ad agency called Sterling Cooper in the late 50s, early 60s. And Sterling Cooper have gender parity. Every man has a secretary. <laughs> so yeah, it's important to recognize that quotas are flawed. But before you say nay to quotas or borrow one of the easy lines of argument I've given you against them, ask, do we live in a society where privilege plays no part in opportunity? And does merit truly equal effort plus ability today? Um, and the answer to that is quite clearly no. And as long as that is true, quotas may be the only way of achieving a world where they are obsolete. We talk a lot about men, women, and gender balances. That's because we spent like thousands of years shaping and rationalizing gender roles, and it's hard to wrap our head around why that shouldn't be a thing anymore. But diversity is more than that. Diversity is intersectional, and arguing about diversity along one dimension or another is fighting for a kind of diversity that unequally benefits just one group. And it's disregarding the challenges that lie at the intersection of, say, being a woman and a person with a disability, or non-binary and a person of color. And the kind of diversity worth fighting for, I think, is more about people, more people from different races, different cultures, different walks of life. Um, people of all abilities and any or no gender rubbing shoulders from management meetings to fashion shows um, so that like, one day maybe working class kids won't have to get working class jobs and more of us will be able to lead lives free of discrimination and stigma. So yeah, what about diversity in tech? If you Google, why is diversity important in tech, you will come across a measly few, no, just kidding, like there's literally hundreds, of articles to the tune of because it's good for business. And there's also solid proof that diversity is good for business. So there are recent and conclusive and very vast studies with sample sizes of hundreds of companies from major consultancies like BCG, Deloitte, showing that diverse companies are more financially performant and more innovative. And there's also proof that a lack of diversity is bad for business. So, study by McKinsey, um, companies um, with the least racially and gender diverse leadership structures were 25% more likely to have financial returns below their industry median. That is a huge number. So yeah, statistics like these, they're great for getting executive buy-in for diversity initiatives. But if I'm going to paraphrase my colleague Alice Bartlett, it's good for business is the line you give to people who are so uninterested in making the world better for anyone but themselves that it's good for business is all you have. And it's good for business holds little sway over public opinion. It doesn't help with fixing unfairness and inequality, and it won't help you build a diverse workplace from the ground up. And also, yeah, how boring, because as someone outside of your company, I don't care if it needs me or people like me to be better itself. I think that caring about diversity requires a moral argument that acknowledges inequity. There's systemic inequality of access to education, access to employment, and we have persistent stereotypes around race, gender, wealth, and our institutions still come with unequal outcomes built in, which benefit some people more than others. And if you think about it, diversity statistics are a really good barometer of these social justice issue and equality issue, because and because diversity is an issue of social justice, then caring about diversity absolutely means caring about it from a moral perspective. And the more people care, the better. And the better chance for society to change, because ignorance is part of the oppression. So who can argue with that? Nobody actually will. 
Um, okay, maybe like bad people or ignorant people, but good people like you and me acknowledge that diversity perpetuates injustice and is perpetuated by injustice and will educate ourselves about ways we can do something about that. Um, yeah, with one proviso, sometimes we say and do things not for their intrinsic value, but for what they say about us. And that's called virtue signaling. So a lot of what happens on social media, like Twitter, is basically virtue signaling. It's showing off how right on you are, and it often comes from a position of privilege. And the hard truth is that there's a lot of focus, um, self-congratulating focus on diversity, and that's unhelpful because the space between caring, not giving a shit, isn't is a follow-up. Purpose is nothing without considerate implementation. So Tim Cadillac said something that stuck with me yesterday. Um, change from the top down is not altruistic. So let's take a selfish perspective. Diversity of thought and experience, that's something most of us strive for as individuals and in our quest for knowledge and our choice of pursuits in life and the experiences we seek out and the people we connect with. Now, compared with everything else, we spend a lot of our time at work for a significant portion of our lives. We come to trust our colleagues and we gravitate into these circles of trust, implicit trust, and we rely on one another to share ideas, um, make decisions, tackle problems together, and socialize. We turn to our leaders for direction and advice and we seek out their support and relish it. And in turn, we offer support to others in regard to work and, and beyond. And we give emotional support and we make friends and we make cliques. So, in other words, we create networks. And these are informal and sometimes social networks through which we diversify our knowledge, thought and experience. And such informal networks were the subject of study of someone called Professor David Crackhart from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he coined the term cognitive um, social structures in the 90s and then spent a lot of time studying how the way people are connected at work correlates with economic performance indicators for organizations because that's where the money's at, right? So from David Crackhart, it's led me into a little internet search, and I came across a super interesting study um, in HBR, and it's free, and you can absolutely view it afterwards. It's a study by Heydrich and Struggles, who are a global executive search firm. And um, the study surveyed all employees of a large company about their colleagues, and they asked questions like, whom would you trust to discuss concern about a work-related issue? Or whom would you ask to support a proposal of yours that might be unpopular? And with one day of training, whose job could you step into? And a lot of questions like this. What they were doing, they, they were collecting network data, essentially. So they mapped these connections uh, between people on a directed graph um, representing various informal networks. And they used these graphs to analyze with graph theory, the gender distribution and the connectedness um, um, and what that means for these networks. So I decided to run a few simulations of what informal networks might look like using the FT's senior leadership team 36-64 gender split. And all these simulations look pretty similar, so here's just one of them. Does anything jump out at you? Okay, so women have fewer connections overall, but that's because there are more men than women, so hi, I'm Captain Obvious, but apart from that, like, try working out how many women are likely to be involved in any given decision-making chain. Do you see where I'm going with this? So, in a HBR study, the decision-making network had 14% more ties between members of the same gender than they would have expected without giving any consideration to gender. The innovation or idea-sharing network had 22% more same-gender ties. And if you look at the graph in the middle, you see that women are less central than men and then completely absent from some areas, and they tend to have fewer incoming ties overall. So that essentially means that fewer people seek them out to discuss new ideas. 
So yeah, let that sink in. And the, and the trouble is, even if you had as many women as men, 50-50, you'd still likely have a disproportionate ratio of same gender ties. Um, because if diversity is bricks, something called inclusion is the mortar. And it turns out we are, by virtue of human nature, quite crap at inclusivity. We're bad at it because we have subtle biases and blind spots and we gravitate towards people like us. This creates echo chambers and leads to exclusion and self-exclusion. And then minority groups try to conform and it's often just to cope, to cope or to avoid being stereotyped. And they de-emphasize their otherness and adopt the traits and behaviors of the majority. And this, this is our society is partly to blame for this. It happens because we, and yeah, sometimes unwittingly, portray the majority as the prototype for success. And in doing so, we are denying others the right to belong. So effectively, people from minority groups are either assimilated or excluded, which reminds me of this um, old ad campaign from O2. You might be familiar with it. Um, be more dog, um, except the pack, which is the majority group, puts up resistance in our case. And that's because they perceive reverse favoritism and they feel excluded from diversity initiatives. So don't be more dog. I hope that what you'll take away from what I just said now is that diversity is nothing without inclusion. Um, and I really love this quote by uh, Aubrey Blanche. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being glad you're there. And the fact is that too many of us are still having a really terrible time at far too many parties. Okay, so what's going down in the tech party scene? Um, this is a drawing of the Stack Overflow Dev Survey, one of the questions. And this year, they asked developers how they assess potential jobs. Now, 30.4%, which is a vast majority, felt that diversity was their lowest priority. Um, closely followed by how a company is funded and the industry they would be working in. Well, not so closely funded. It's a vast majority. Diversity doesn't matter. And then different types of developers have different priorities when it comes to choosing jobs. So gender minorities like women, NB and others, they rank the company culture and the environment they'll be working in as the highest factor in their choice. And the other 90-something percent rank pay the highest. And yeah, the Stack Overflow Developer Survey made me really sad, and I hope it's an eye-opener. But before we all emigrate to the moon, <laughs> let's admit that there are things in our power that can make things OK. And let's acknowledge that it's our collective responsibility to make things better. Um, so this wouldn't be fair if I didn't offer some suggestions of what you could do. You start by understanding your own bias, because we're all biased. And then keeping your privilege in, well in check. Um, so neither of these things is easy or obvious. They require a lot of introspection, which is hard. They require honesty, which is even tougher, and, and they require going out and doing some research about biases and the phenomenon of privilege. But that's mostly on the internet, so you should absolutely do that. Next, you should hire people people, so people who care and will make a difference to um, the inclusivity of your company. And you should hire from underrepresented groups, because who better to contribute to solving the problem. Uh, obviously, this is also hard. It's hard for us. I'm sure you've had the same experiences in your companies. And you'll meet a lot of opposition. And it's usually along you know, the following lines. Someone will say, like, yeah, diversity is really important, but we can't lower the bar. OK, so this bar is bullshit. It's nothing but a consensus which comes from a position, a long-held, um, established position of privilege, um, which is people who have been developer and developers for ages and are in that place creating that culture, the culture that is wrong. Um, interestingly enough, a recent internal study at Google found that there's zero relationship between an interviewing saying, hire, and the candidate actually being a good hire. So, yeah, no one in tech 
actually has a bar that works very well in determining good versus bad hires, and that's regardless of gender or ethnicity. And then I think another common one is the what I call the pipeline argument. So someone will say, oh, not enough minorities are applying. Women just aren't interested in my meetup. I, I keep trying to get them to... No. Okay. Ask why and then fix it. Um, if you're looking at job descriptions, there are tools out there. Textio is one of them. That analyze your job descriptions and point out the more obvious um, points of improvement. And yeah, sure, you might have a long list of bullet point requirements um, because it feels natural, but you have to understand that these lists implicitly select for the majority and the majority will apply when they meet a much smaller portion of them. It's a confidence thing. Okay, so maybe you don't have bullet points. It's quite common these days that you would be more excited about a candidate's GitHub or you know, ask them if they blog and if they speak publicly and if they contribute to open source community. Um, how many underemployed single moms do you think that will hire you? Because I bet none. Yeah, your job is to build the best team and you can choose a lot of strategies to get there. Um, and no matter what you choose, if your strategy is to hire the best candidate for each role without regard to the team's composition, and it's leaving you with a weaker, less diverse team, then your strategy is failing and needs to change. Reach out to underrepresented groups. If you don't know where to start with gender minorities in tech, try Twitter. It's just full of us. Support and nurture people, and don't just hire them and leave them to get on with it, because they'll either be assimilated or excluded, and you fundamentally failed at creating an inclusive environment. Offer recognition, so shout about the triumphs of minorities in tech. Be a feminist, or even better, be more than a feminist. Build up your empathy and your social intelligence, and get comfortable with tampons and pronouns and leave no one out, no matter their gender, ability, and race, or class. Um, speak up. Silence serves no one. Being your true self is really important. So speak as your true self. And it's, it's don't worry if you're uncomfortable, because it's OK to be awkward. And this stage is kind of awkward, and I'm kind of awkward. And thank you for listening to me. Um, but speak up when others can't. Call out bad, harmful attitudes, harmful behaviors. And don't say stuff like this. Don't say complacent stuff. Don't accept the status quo, even if you're a minority. Just take responsibility for your words, especially as you get more senior and you can get further along in your career and then invariably you have more influence because people will listen. So get a soapbox, use that privilege to support and celebrate the people who need it most. Listen to people. Pay close attention to marginalized voices. Get out of your comfort zone. Make new connections. Broaden your perspectives, but do it, do it with intention and compassion. Don't just sort of turn up and like, hey, you're a person of color. Tell me what it's like. That's not how it works. So seek to understand the more specific issues that others are facing. But don't make assumptions. Don't try to be the savior. You're not a savior. Try to understand. Join some support groups if your business offers them. Go to meetups. And celebrate diversity. Make it an inclusive party. Because tolerating difference is not the same as embracing it. Tweet the slide. This is a really important slide. Um, while I'm here, I can tell you a little story. Um, I gave this talk about two weeks ago um, at a small internal thing at a large media organization. And it brought back some memories that my mind had blocked for about six years or something, um, because that's what happens with bad experiences. You tend to just try and forget. So I tried to become a developer about six years ago. It didn't work out for me. I applied to a graduate scheme. They were saying, like, oh, it's OK, you don't need a computer science degree. We're here to help. I didn't have a computer science degree. I still don't. Um, and I got rejected. 
and they hired someone with a master's in computer science, a white man. But still, it kind of defeats the purpose of having a graduate scheme, or at least the attempt to be honest and transparent about your hiring process. So ironically, I was in this place two weeks ago, and I was giving this talk in an abridged version, and I sort of nodded and smiled to myself, and it was a small moment of personal success. And afterwards, one of the organizers came to me like, does name so-and-so ring a bell? I'm like, yeah, you know, they were hired. I applied here about six years ago. I don't expect you to remember, but they were hired in my place. Oh, well. They say it's a shame we didn't hire you. Okay, that was me. Um, and there's a bunch of really lovely, lovely artists who let me use their work. So if you want to take a picture of this slide and hit up their websites, they're really, really talented. Thanks for listening.